Chapter 23 Saturday night, it was moonless and cloudy. Dense, dark shadows seemed to settle on the world. It was a night made for crime, for sneaky, spooky, and extra dark deeds. Quark must have loved it. A burglar works better under cover of darkness, but then so do I. And as logic would have it, what's good for the cat burglar is good for the cat. At eleven on the dot, I wasn't taking any chances. We were all in our various and well-planned positions. Butch, Jane, and Oscar on the office building roof. Sue, Spike, and Sugary in Kitty's apartment. Angie and the Fangs on the yuppie roof above. I visited the battle stations, checking on morale. This waiting around is boring, Oscar said. If you call it a stakeout, Jane said, it's exciting. No, it isn't, Oscar said. I don't care what you call it, man. Boring is boring. It's boring, I agreed. But it's important, okay? You're going to give us all a signal as soon as you see Quark. What's the signal? Oscar said. I'm so bored I forgot. The signal, Butch prompted him, is meow meow meow. That's the stupidest word I ever heard, Oscar said. This is dumb beyond belief. Jane sighed. Listen, Oscar, I'll tell you what we do. We'll pretend it's a cop show. You like to watch cop shows? Boring. Oscar said, I saw a cop show on Sunday. All the cops did was just chase the guy around, and around and around, in a dumb, stupid circle. After a while, they all collapsed in a heap. Oscar, Jane appealed to him, that was no cop show. You were looking at the dryer. So what? Oscar said. Televisions, dryers, it's all the same story. You know? Butch looked at me. Oscar's got a point. I suggested that everybody try to relax, but not enough to fall asleep. On the roof next door, it was a totally different story. Activity. Excitement. Chang was doing chin-ups on the television antenna. Wang practiced leaping from a table to a chair while Sturm, Drang, and Angie played leapfrog on the grill. Okay, I said carefully. You guys know what to do. Double somersault, Wang said, erupting off the chair, doing two entire circles in the middle of nowhere, and landing on the blue of a blue and white umbrella. Okay, I said happily. You know what to do. But remember not to do it till he's on the way out out, not in. I got a question, Angie said. Can I bite him on the nose? I shrugged. I suppose. Hold it, hold it, Ching said. That's a rap number, brothers. He left the antenna and landed on the tiles and started stomping out the beat. And a one, and a two, and a one, one, two. Can I bite him on the nose till it's red like a rose, till it flows like a hose, till it drips on his clothes, till he drops to his toes, till it no longer blows, till he no longer knows if his nose is a nose? I suppose, I suppose, I suppose. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 Angie said. On second thought, I looked at them. Don't bite his nose. The scene in the apartment was cozier and calm. I entered through the cat door, a small hinged panel at the bottom of the otherwise locked terrace door. Spike was at the living room window peering out. Sue was in the kitchen reclining on the counter, and Sugary was curled up and resting on the bed. The lights were all out, and the apartment was silent. Are you scared? I said to Sugary. A little bit, she said. Are you? I started nodding. A little bit, I said. In a scary situation, being scared is common sense. I checked out the night table right beside the bed. Radio, alarm clock, telephone, lamp. Miss Kitty said there aren't any jewels in the bedroom, 
So the only thing he's after is the Rumpelmeyer sugary. Spike says it's worth about a hundred thousand bucks. Are you trying to tell me he won't come into the bedroom? If he does, I said soothingly, he'll rush in and out. Now you know what to do, and you know when to do it. She nodded. Good luck. From the white kitchen countertop, Sue whispered, Psst! You're fine, I said, aren't you? Why are you assuming I'm fine? She said testily. Just because I'm level-headed, gutsy, and efficient, it doesn't mean I'm fine. I looked her in the eye. You need support and reassurance. Darn right I do, she said. I kept looking at her face. I trust you more than anyone I know, I said warmly. And I'd fight to the death to protect you. Okay? Are you serious? Of course not, I said. I say that to everyone. She stared for a second, then grinned, and then laughed. In the living room, Spike was still sitting on the ledge. He looked at me somberly. You think it's going to work? I glanced at the Rumpelmeyer, sitting on a shelf. We'd carefully removed it from the spot on the table, just far enough away so that Quark would have to waste a few minutes on the hunt. I glanced at the stereo, a stack of components on the other side of the room. I looked back at Spike and said, Absolutely nothing. I might have said, Well, who knows? Or, Let's hope. But I opened my mouth, and the sound that filled the living room was, Meow, meow, meow. The signal! I suddenly streaked through the cat door and bounded to the roof.